Thank you very much. It's uh, delighted to be back at the RSA. I was here, I guess, a couple of years ago, and it was a, a wonderful crowd then, uh, very convivial and also uh, you know, sort of uh, pretty upbeat. Um, I, I have no problem with questions uh, as broad and as difficult as you'd like to throw at me, so please do. Um, and thanks for filling the house as well. Um, so let me start with this. Uh, the good news in Europe uh, is that uh, we finally seem to take the seriousness of the fiscal direness uh, that we're all facing, uh, particularly here in Britain. The elections went quite well um, from that perspective, boring from an American perspective, but from a we have to deal with the budget and have to get our house in order, I think uh, you know, probably one of the best stories that's come out of Europe all year. Uh, the, the bad news, of course, is it may be too late. Um, the good news in the United States is we have much more fiscal rope to hang ourselves with. Uh, the bad news is we do seem intent on using it. Um, the good news in Japan, I mean, there, there's really, there really is almost no good news in Japan. Um, I suppose it's that they're, they're, they seem to be learning quite well how to live with 0% consistent growth. Um, and if that is the new normal, they're ahead of the curve. So, I mean, there's an advantage in that. Um, so the world's developed states, those, those countries that have been at the forefront of the world's economy for the past 40-some years um, are not doing so well right now. And, and who's doing well? Who's doing well coming out of the global recession? Uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, Russia, and China, most importantly China. And, and these countries all share something that I find interesting which, and important, uh, which is that uh, the state is the principal actor in all of these economies. They are state capitalists, as I would define them, and they use the markets for ultimately political purposes. Now, I name my book The End of the Free Market, which is a somewhat bleak title. Do I really believe it is the end of the free market, or am I just another American trying to sell books in this fine nation? Um, the, the answer is both. <laughs> um, I, uh, I named the book that. Uh, I was in a meeting uh, back last May. I got a phone call from the Chinese embassy, and uh, they wanted to know if I was available the following week to meet with He Yafei, who was the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of China, to exchange views. And fortunately for me, I was in town. So we get together, and the following week, I'm sitting across from this fellow, and we exchange pleasantries. And the first question he asked me, said, so Ian, now that the free market has failed, what do you think the appropriate role of the state in the economy should be? So I thought about how to answer that. And uh, my response was, well, you know, just because the self-regulation of banks turns out to be not such a great way to run the economy, and as it turns out, oil companies, and automotives, healthcare, um, 45 percent of US GDP, but just because that's not a good way to run the economy does not mean that the state as the principal actor in the economy in the absence of rule of law is a better way to run the economy. Though I thought to myself it is certainly much more politically expedient. So here we were. And as I said we were exchanging views, so 90 minutes we exchanged views, and over the course of 90 minutes we got closer to each other. We got to hear. Um, but but we, we did not get to hear, and, and we weren't gonna get to hear. And the G20, replacing the G7, is not getting to here. Uh, it is an absence of governance. The G20 is the Security Council. It's a great place for people to get together. It's good that they have talks that are meaningful and substantive on the sidelines. Nothing is accomplished. Uh, nothing will be accomplished. We have Copenhagen. We have nonproliferation. We have Doha. We have collective security all of which suffer from an utter absence of governance. Those situations will become exacerbated by the growth of state capitalism. Now, I am not trying to argue that state capitalism is a bad system. Um, we can talk about normative issues and values if you like. The important part of my book is that it is a system that is here, it is with us, it is particularly strong in this environment, and it is not going away anytime soon. There are implications of that. Implication number one is that we're going to see lower economic growth. 
because for the past 40 years, the world has been all about multinational corporations as the dominant economic players taking advantage of increasingly global consumer markets, labor markets, and capital markets. And we are now in an environment where that will be constrained and that will reduce efficiency of multinational corporations. I write in the book about the movie Network. Some of you may remember the movie Network uh, where you have a thundering character, main character saying there is no U.S. government, there is only Union Carbide and IBM. Those of you in my generation, I could have written about Robocop or Rollerball, could have written about Naomi Klein's book, No Logo. Are these, do these people have no shame? I mean, it seems very quaint to talk about multinational corporations taking over the world in today's environment. We wish we could go back to those dystopias. We have our own dystopias now. Um, the second, the subtitle of my book is Who Wins the War Between States and Corporations? And let me be very clear on this. When there is a war between a state and a corporation, the corporation loses. So if you are a corporation and you are facing off against the state, it behooves you, number one, to realize that you have a problem. Frequently they don't. Number two, you have to either adapt or you leave. You don't want to actually fight. If you continue to fight, you get Googled out, and that is a problem, right? This has happened before uh, with oil companies. Today, 15 world's largest oil companies, top 13 in terms of reserves, owned by states. Didn't used to be that way. It used to be private companies, international oil corporations. They would go to a dictator. They would put straw on the ground. They would give the dictator some cash, and they'd pull out oil. And that worked really well until the dictators realized that they had their own straws. At which point, if you were an oil company, like BP's predecessor right, in Iran, um, you could no longer be in the straw business. You could do other things that would make you valuable to countries. You could, for example, like ExxonMobil, become a great technology company, a management company, a gas company, even a biofuels company. But you were not in the business of just poking straws in the ground because they don't need you for that anymore. There was a war between states and corporations. The states won. Corporations either adapted or they failed. My argument is that we are now going to see that play out in the world's second largest and fastest growing major economy. And that companies are in the midst of understanding that. We've seen Jeff Imelt being misquoted by the Financial Times in the last week from GE saying, I, we just, they just don't want us to make any money over there. You've seen um, Steve Ballmer from Microsoft coming out publicly and saying, China's not our future. We can go to Indonesia, we can go to India. You've seen Google with their problems. Now, I've heard this a lot privately, a little surprising they'd say it publicly. You know, in an environment where the US and Europe and Japan are all looking anemic, you would think the multinational corporations would be waxing publicly very, very favorably about China, but they're not. And what we're going to see is this relationship is going to become very politicized. Um, and we need to get ready for that. Now, I'm saying a lot right now about state capitalism. I haven't talked as much about the free market. Just to be clear about where I stand on the free market, I, 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 it's pretty clear from my book that you have problems long term with efficiency and the sustainability of growth if states capture corporations. It is also a problem if corporations capture states. And what we have seen in the last 20 years in the U.S. in particular is an environment where not only were multinational corporations in the private sector the most important economic actors, but the government was largely absent from the process. And that, in my mind, is not an effectively running free market system. That's a hyper-capitalism. Because if you talk to the folks that run Goldman Sachs, and you talk to the folks that run AIG, and you talk to the folks that run BP, and you ask them honestly, do they want a free market, the answer is no. They have no interest in a free market. They have interest in state subsidies, which is why you see the kind of cases that are brought to the WTO and protection. And they have the interest in monopolies. And they have the interest in, in maximizing short-term efficiency and profit so that compensation and shareholder returns actively reflect that, which is why risk management practices in many of these corporations that are under-regulated tend to be weak. 
and which is why BP and ExxonMobil don't pay much attention to what happens in the case of catastrophic failure, and neither does Goldman Sachs if the CDOs blow up, and neither do a lot of Western corporations throwing all their technology for decades in China, and then it gets stolen, and they say, wait a second, we've got a problem here. So we do need to recognize that on the domestic front, effective regulation is important. And on the international front, we're about to enter into an environment where industrial policy will be debated. And that's going to be very interesting. Because when you have state capitalist countries that go into authoritarian regimes in Africa and lock up commodities and buy enterprises using companies that have the state behind them, and Western corporations can't effectively compete, you're going to have a call for industrial policy. And of course, that's going to lead to many charges that bureaucrats are incompetent and they won't be able to do this effectively and all the rest. A happy medium will be found. Japan, historically, has had a very strong industrial policy with METI. They have organizations like JBIC and NEXI providing political risk insurance and cheap credit uh, for their corporations, um, much stronger than, say, MEGA and OPIC in the United States. I think there's going to be a very active debate about those sorts of things in the United States going forward. Now, what do I think long term? Do I believe that we are in an environment where the free market will lose? No, I do not. I think the free market is a less safe bet than it was three years ago. But I would still bet on it. Let's face it, the Chinese are still betting on it. I mean, over $900 billion of Chinese exposure to U.S. Treasuries, to the U.S. dollar, because they have nowhere else to go. It's the world's largest economy. It has uh, extraordinary levels of entrepreneurship, so much so that the British government is trying to figure out why they can't have a Silicon Valley here. Um, and it also has more money spent on research and development than any other country in the world by a very long margin, though they haven't been investing much in it recently. Um, all of those things give you reason to believe that the next big things are as likely to be in the West as anywhere else, much more likely. Uh, the biggest thing in the last two years, the development of non-conventional gas, overwhelmingly a U.S. story because they have the corporations, they have the R&D, they have the intellectual property, they have the entrepreneurship. Most of those things, not all, and perhaps less than we would have seen 10 years ago, but most of them in the next 23 or 30 years will probably be in the West and particularly the United States. That's a relatively safe bet. But we also need to recognize that there's a lot of unsustainability long-term in the Chinese model. They understand very clearly that because they can no longer sell as much stuff to the West because the West can't afford it and because they need strong economic growth continuously to ensure their own political stability and survival they must change their strategies. Those changes are very simple. Diversification of exports away from the West, South-South and towards Asia. Development of their own technologies so that of what they do manufacture, a larger percentage of profits stay in China. And third, building out the domestic consumer base. All of those things make sense. All of those things take time. And as it takes time, they will be under more pressure. More pressure because of environmental degradation in China, water, land resources, air quality. More pressure because of climate change and volatility in markets as a consequence of that. State capitalists don't like volatility in markets. More pressure because of increasingly fighting against India, which is becoming much more resource intensive for commodities that are increasingly scarce in parts of the world that are unstable. More problematic and more pressure uh, because of demographic challenges as the Chinese get old before they get rich and the Indians move to a more favorable demographic environment. So as a consequence, labor rates get pushed up and China's not as competitive vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And also because the system's not set up well for indigenous innovation. In other words, I happen to believe China is a bubble, but it's the biggest bubble the world has ever seen. And in the near to medium term, I know what we do with bubbles. We ride them. You don't want to be the first one off that bus. China's not falling apart in five years. The average Chinese is much happier with the Chinese government today than the average American is with the American government, or any of the Europeans, or Lord knows the Japanese. 
Um, and uh, I'm not, I hate to pick on the Japanese. I like the Japanese. So we can, if you want, to ask me, and I'll tell you something nice about the Japanese and during questions. Um, but uh, you know that is a reality, um, and, and as a consequence, we are going to see this relationship become much more politicized. The world's most important economic relationship. And I know what happens when relationships get politicized, whether they're personal relationships or work relationships or diplomatic relationships, they tend to not function as smoothly. Uh, and we, we're, we're into that. That's happening. Uh, and if you combine that with the relative absence of governance, we're in for a rocky ride for the near to medium term. Now here's the big point, which is that in that environment, it's going to be really hard for the West to stick to their principles to stick to relatively open trade, relatively open borders, relatively open education. There's going to be a lot of nativism. 17.2% real unemployment does not surprise me when you get the reaction in the US that you have on Arizona immigration, or when you get the numbers you presently do in the US on globalization, which are way down. That's going to grow. But when China gets to the point that they start to get really squeezed, they're going to have to make a choice. At that point, do they start reintegrating with the West? Do they lose a little bit of political power so that they can continue to grow economically? Or do they go the nationalist, xenophobic, patriotic, blame the West route? They are much more likely to do the latter if the US and the Europeans have taken steps that already create a more zero-sum environment. We must be vigilant about that. My view is the best defense is a strong offense. That means that the present trip coming up of the British leadership to India should be a very strong one. You want to build on trade and build on intellectual property protection and coordination of economic policies with countries where those values are there. It meant that Obama's decision to move ahead with the South Korea Free Trade Agreement, despite the fact that there's no political support for it, was actually a pretty good move, particularly for a president that so far has shown very little willingness to do anything that isn't politically expedient. I think you give credit for that. And then you push on doing Japan right afterwards, which is possible because the farmers aren't as powerful domestically as they used to be, and Hadayama is gone with a more competent PM in place now. See, I talked nice things about Japan. Um, and, uh, and those are the directions I think we need to move. But I fully recognize that it's not politically popular to discuss them now. Not an election period in the United States, not given domestic constituencies in Europe. We want to talk about stimulus in Europe when that stimulus would be Germans giving money to Greeks. Who wants to talk about that? You know, it's going to be very, very unpopular to talk about open markets in an environment where everyone wants to blame the open market system for what's actually gone wrong. So I want to spend just 20 minutes talking to you a little bit about, you know, some basic ideas around the book. I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of what I'm on about, as it were, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to a, a pretty uh, spirited discussion with all of you. Thank you. Um, here in the UK, we, um, you know, are kind of as, as close as we possibly got in recent times has been our holdings of RBS and Northern Rock. And there's been a huge amount of, you know, um, political kind of, you know, discussions about whether we should still hold on to them, whether we should have, you know, got into this. Now, where do you think the future lies for, you know, countries like the, U the UK, where there is that kind of very ideological kind of, um, in a sense, uh, you know, kind of negativity towards the state getting involved in corporations? Well, I think it's useful uh, that you have such a negativity in the state taking over corporations. Uh, there was negativity in the United States uh, for the bailout of the automotive companies, despite the fact that you would have had a lot. I mean, we're talking millions of Americans probably losing their jobs if they'd let that industry go. If you talk about the parts producers and the folks in the supply chain and the dealers and all the rest. But you know they took it over. But Obama had to come out very clearly, and this is a pro-labor presidency, and say we have no interest in running these companies because the opposition to that is strong. You, you're, the uh, the fact is that so m my book, you've gotten a couple of reactions to my book. I mean, in general, I think it's it's kind of touched a bunch of nerves because first of all, none of us can stomach reading anything else about the financial crisis. Um, <laughs> but but beyond that, you know, people are like where are we right now? And 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 I would say that while the center right and left has generally been on a lot of these ideas, I've gotten some some interesting responses from far left and far right. The response from the far, um, the far right is, 
Obama is a socialist. Obama is a state capitalist. And, and, and this is the big problem right now. Um, and he needs to be stopped. That's absurd. Um, and it's not absurd because I love Obama. It's absurd because CEOs in America have more power in terms of corporate lobbies with Democrats and Republicans in Congress than in any other country in the developed world, which is why they might complain bitterly, but they're not thinking of changing their domicile anytime soon. Um, the Supreme Court is overwhelmingly in favor. And I think we need to recognize none of the Europeans are moving state capitalists. The, the pendulum had swung really far towards government doing nothing, uh, right? Particularly in the US, but you know, in the UK to a degree as well, in a number of different sectors, financial institutions in particular. Mm -hmm. Not in Canada, and, and Canada ended up coming through this a little better. You know what, after this is all through, the US is gonna look a little more like Canada. The pendulum's swinging back. It's gonna look a little more like France. There are a lot of Americans, you say that, they go nuts. <laughs> but the, the reality of my, what I'm trying to say in my book is that these are actually comparatively tiny issues to this big global thing that's coming down the pike, which is truly incompatible, and where there's going to be a fight, and we're going to have to deal with that.